Good evening, everyone. My name is Meg Pierce. I am the Executive Director of the League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania. So glad to be with you tonight. Thank you so much for taking time to join us this evening. For your awareness, this webinar is being recorded. And a reminder that closed captioning is available in this Zoom webinar. To enable closed captions on your screen, click Live Transcript in your Zoom taskbar. And if you need more assistance with closed captioning, we are dropping a help document in the chat. And if we can improve accessibility for you in any way during the course of this event, please let us know in the chat. A little bit about the League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania, the organization that is bringing you this event. We are a nonpartisan nonprofit organization. Our state office oversees a grassroots network of 33 local leagues all across the state of Pennsylvania. The League encourages informed and active participation in government, works to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influences policy through education and advocacy. To learn more about our work and to subscribe to our action alerts, please visit our website. We're gonna drop a couple of links in the chat for you to learn more about the League of Women Voters. I'm pleased to welcome you tonight to Ballot Box Basics, Information Every Voter Needs. We design these monthly webinars because we at the League understand that voting, government, and elections can be complicated. These monthly webinars will discuss important topics like registering to vote, voting integrity, voter ID requirements, election security, constitutional amendments, and much more. And we believe that whether you're a first time voter or have voted in every election that you've been eligible for, we think you'll learn something new. To watch previous recordings of Ballot Box Basics webinars or to sign up for future events, we will drop a link in the chat where you can sign up. Tonight's event will feature a tour of Pennsylvania state government. Throughout the presentation, you are welcome and strongly encouraged to ask questions using the Q&A function of Zoom. We will leave about 10 minutes for Q&A at the end of the event. I am very happy and honored to now introduce Pat Christmas, who is the Policy Director at the Committee of 70. Pat is responsible for managing 70's policy agenda and advocacy campaigns, in addition to supporting its election programming and communications. From 2014 to 2017, he oversaw the evolution of 70's signature election day field operation into a broader set of civic initiatives, including an election ambassador corps for high school students, a voter experience survey, and a comprehensive online voter guide and toolkit. His primary duties are to work with local and state election officials to administer safe, secure, and accessible elections and to advance reforms that bolster ethical, representative and effective government. We are honored to have him here tonight. Pat is a friend of the league, as is Committee of 70. Pat, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Meg, going, uh, going off mute there. Good evening, everyone. Um, it is a real pleasure to be with uh, you all this evening and as part of this uh, really important series, Ballot Box Basics. Um, I think it's fair to say, especially over the government at the local level, state level, federal level, um, has has uh, has never been more important. It's it's always been important, but uh, certainly the the political moment that the United States is going through uh, right now has just you know exponentially increased the the salience and consequence uh, of our structure of government and how folks how folks participate uh, in it. So um, it is a again a real pleasure and honor to be with you this evening. And uh, the topic uh, for tonight is. A state government, um, a tour, a tour state government, um, and so what we'll what we'll endeavor to do here is, uh, you know, walk through some of the the bigger pieces of state government here in Pennsylvania, um, and I know this is this is surely a, a hyper informed group, um, so you know some of this or maybe a lot of it for some of you uh, may be pretty pretty familiar, um, but I think one of the ways we can see the um, see the the goal at the at the end of this uh, this session tonight is. With, with everything we're reading in the papers. And there's surely a lot to read about government and politics uh, now uh, here in Pennsylvania and, and elsewhere. Um, when these pieces of government get mentioned, of course the actors within them and how they are 
uh, relating to each other, uh, which often case this means fighting. Um, you know how, how that's how that's working. What what the laws are that either give uh, give latitude or restrict uh, a given a given piece of government or a given public officer uh, from uh, from doing something or, or not not doing something. Um, so and we'll and then we'll have at least one example at the end here about how uh, how things are not working the way they're supposed to. And, and unfortunately, uh, of course, there are far too many examples of systems. Uh, and of our government basically not working the way it's supposed to. So uh, bear with me for one minute here as I pull up some slides uh, and we'll start to walk through um, this uh, this tour. So uh, this is this is the start, right? I figure this is something that pretty much I'm sure everyone here is here is familiar with. Um, just like the federal government, we have uh, three branches uh, here in Pennsylvania, and these are all described uh, in our in our state constitution, which has gone through several iterations. Uh, over the past couple of years. And so, you know, the, the fundamental uh, purposes or functions of each of these branches is the same as, as the federal government, right? Our legislature makes laws, our executive carries them out, and our judicial branch interprets those laws. Um, like most, like the U.S. Congress and like most other state legislatures, our, our legislature, the, the general assembly is, is bicameral, uh, two chambers. The executive okay. branch, yes. Uh, just sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to let you know that your slides are not visible. Did you share the oh. screen? Oh no, I, I sure I sure did not. How about that? I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad you caught me then, and not uh, and then not later. <laughs> the good news the good news is everybody here was thinking about the uh, that one page in their social studies textbooks that had the three branches. Okay, that's showing up, isn't it? Yes, you're good, you're good to go. Sweet. <laughs> all right. So, all right. Now that you've had the image of the three branches in your social from your social studies textbooks in your in your head, uh, just transfer on onto the screen here. Um, uh, we were on the executive branch and how this this can vary a little bit from from state to state and how the executive branch, at least in Pennsylvania, consists not only of the governor uh, and lieutenant governor, but the several row offices as well, um, which are which are uh, independently elected: the auditor general, treasurer, and attorney general. And we'll come back to each of these. Uh, in, a, in a few slides, and other states, uh, those row raw offices, if they exist, um, can be can be appointed. But of course, the, the governor is the the chief chief executive officer of that uh, of that branch. And of course, the judicial branch, right? We have a number of different courts, trial courts, kind of towards the bottom of the food chain, and then three levels of appellate courts with the with this, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court uh, at the very top. So figured we'd start off with something that's uh, you know the basic of the basic of basics. Um, and uh, this will kind of give us context for, for going forward. So we'll start to walk through now each of the branches, how they're set up, some maybe some dynamics in and around them and their, their, their basic powers. So right there, our legislature, very similar to any other state legislature or the US Congress, they pass bills and they pass resolutions, uh, right? That's, that's their, their kind of their, their, principal, their principal function. Um, of course, with a, with, a, with a given bill, a, a governor can, can veto, uh, that piece of legislation, and so the, the, our legislature has, uh, I think, a reasonably high bar of a two-thirds vote uh, to override that veto. They have uh, the power of the purse and adopt a state budget. Um, also, like our, our U.S. Congress, they have uh, the power of impeachment, uh, with a pretty similar system to what uh, what exists in the in the U.S. Constitution, where uh, the House, in this case the Pennsylvania House, would go through a debate and then have a vote on impeaching a public official. Uh, but then after that point, there'd be a trial uh, in the Senate uh, and where there'd also have to be a vote in this, in this case, a two thirds vote to convict a given uh, public official. And this is, a, this is a, of course, a, an instrument of government that you hope you wouldn't use too often. Uh, very, very high profile now, of course, given um, what's happened at the, at the federal level with, with the former President Trump. And then I guess most recently, the, the headlines you've probably been seeing around uh, this mechanism have involved uh, Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner uh, and the threats of um, at least some uh, lawmakers, Republican lawmakers, of, uh, of impeaching him. Uh, one one point on that is that there there is pretty specific language in the Constitution around uh, impeaching a public official, um, and uh, uh, difference of differences of policy, uh, like there seems to exist between certain lawmakers and, and District Attorney Krasner, you know, may not may not meet uh, you know that threshold. It's it's more. Uh, uh, you know, bad behavior in office that that would uh, that would you know warrant uh, warrant that sort of that sort of mechanism. 
Uh, the last the last bill that I have here, and of course this is not a you know an exhaustive list of powers and duties, but the the last one and the one that we'll we'll talk a little bit at the at the end of the discussion here um, is the the power that the legislature has to initiate uh, amendments to our to our constitution. This is not something that the the people of Pennsylvania have the power to initiate and do themselves, uh, as is the case in in other states, especially younger Western states. Um, this is something the legislature has complete control over, and as I'm sure this group has seen. Uh, a lot of activity, a lot of concern uh, around uh, around how that process is being is being used now. Um, uh, as far as you know, when these when you see these folks you know on your ballots, uh, we have a bunch of lawmakers to to, to vote on. Uh, of course, you're only represented by one representative, one one senator. We don't have multi multi member districts anymore. Um, but all 203 representatives uh, serve, serve two year terms, so they come up every even numbered uh, election cycle. The senators, on the other hand, serve four-year terms uh, that are staggered. Uh, so in one even-numbered election year, you'll have the, the senators from even-numbered districts on the ballot. Two years later, you will have the odd-numbered uh, districts uh, on, the, on the ballot. And there are no term limits uh, for any of these folks, even though there's been like a little bit of activism around, around that. Um, these folks can serve as long, for as long as they can, uh, as long as they can be in office. And as you can see from the, the graphic here, uh, you know the red, the Republican Party holds uh, pretty solid majorities in, uh, in, in each, each of the chambers. Uh, and I'm sure something else that folks are reading about uh, plenty right now is, is whether or not uh, this could change after this after the cycle. Given there's a Democrat in the in the White House, uh, they're generally going to be pretty strong headwinds uh, over. Uh, in this case, the Democratic Party picking off a chamber or two, but these are these are unusual times, and they're kind of a new new factors that new factors at play. So we'll just uh, we'll just have to see. So though, that's the basics about the the legislature. I'm going to point out just a, a couple. Um, oh, actually, before I get to that, not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, um, but uh, <laughs> not going to throw up a, a schoolhouse rock uh, video as well. But I think just making the point that uh, the basic legislative process that our legislature goes through is is pretty. Well, similar in some respects, similar in, the, in, in some fundamental respects to what happens in, in other states um, where a bill gets introduced, has to go into committee, added committee. Uh, it goes to the floor uh, of either the House or the Senate where it gets considered on, on three different days. And then the third day, there's an actual vote on that piece of legislation. Uh, of course, any bill that starts in a given chamber and gets out of that chamber has to go to the other one where it goes through the same basic process and at the end of the line, uh, that piece of legislation will wind its you know, will find its way to the to the governor's desk. So, this is of course supposed to be, you know, a fairly lengthy, definitely deliberative, transparent process um, uh, where there's uh, you know real you know evidence being brought to bear and and you know thoughtful policy making, certainly disagreement and debates and arguments, but you know compromise at times as, as well. That's not that's the way this works every once in a while or at times in our legislature, uh, seemingly more often than not, um, that's not quite the way it works. And as again, we'll get, we'll get to at the, at, the end of the, at the end of the session here, uh, the rules that our legislature gets to pass, which every legislature does get to pass its own rules, dictate uh, overwhelmingly how this, how this basic bill making process you know, works at the end of the day. And, and, and ultimately the, the, um, the caucus leaders, and because the Republican caucus has majorities in both chambers, the Republican leaders uh, have an overwhelming amount of power uh, in this process, which basically means a bill will, will after it gets introduced by any given Democrat or Republican, uh, either it's going to move or it's not going to move. Uh, and of course, it, it doesn't really matter uh, what, what sort of other kind of process is, is dictated here if just a few people can, can control uh, you know whether or not the race only goes one or two one or two blocks or or all the way through. So we'll come back to that at the end. But basic, you know, in, in basic terms, like this is supposed to be pretty similar uh, to any other any other legislative process. So to to, to some dynamics about around the uh, around our, our legislature here, it's it's a big one. Uh, it's it's notoriously big. Uh, I might I might suggest and and full time. Um, the New Hampshire legislature is also big. It's, I believe it's about 400 members, uh, but those, are, those folks are part-time. They are citizen legislators, um, you know, maybe, maybe with a, a small stipend. Our, our legislature is full-time, both the House and the Senate. There are uh, hundreds and hundreds of staff members that support uh, each chamber and, and the caucuses. Um, and it's one of the most expensive, if not the most expensive uh, state legislature in, in the country. So uh, that's, that's, that's one factor. And it's actually, that's, 
that's led to at times um, uh, talk about reducing the size of the legislature, uh, especially on especially on the House side with this this 203 members. Um, I believe I believe the story here is that the legislature increased substantially in size uh, generations ago as a as a good government reform to make it more difficult to create more late lawmakers uh, that would potentially have to be bribed by the powerful interests at the time, right? Railroads and and and, and oil interests. Um, but uh, sometimes uh, reforms kind of outlive their usefulness. And and this is definitely one where there's there's plenty of very principled debate over the size of a given legislature, whether or not our legislature should have to shrink. But uh, the size and the cost of our legislature has spurred some of that, that discussion and, and some and some legislation. Um, in past uh, in past sessions, so this is this is what I was going to point out with the uh, with the slide here. Again, if this is uh, especially a um, hyper-informed, leave women voters fair districts crowd, this this group will be uh, very familiar with the redistricting process and the the not just battle that multiple battles that have been fought around that process going back six or so years now. Um, but this is the map that we wound up with for better or for us. I realize that Allegheny County and Philly are are picked out of there because uh, the districts get pretty small because the population density is so high. Um, but despite there being uh, a redistricting process where, uh, right, we, the whole reason we do that is because people move around, population change, and the, the one person, one vote principle, uh, you know, dictates districts of having the same number of folks inside of, inside of them. That doesn't mean the political power uh, is evenly or proportionally distributed across the state or between, between the two parties. So in the House, um, the, uh, these, these are not all the officers of the House, but these are several of the most powerful officers. Um, you can see where, uh, where, they, where they live and the Republicans, which of course have a majority in the House, tend to come from rural communities. Um, the, uh, uh, the minority leaders, in case, at least in this case in, in the House, from urban communities. And this urban rural divide uh, has always been there, um, also going back generations, but uh, it's always been a challenging uh, dynamic to, to, to work through. Um, and that certainly remains the case today over almost almost every policy issue you can probably you can probably think of. So um, this is a this is a dynamic and factor in the House uh, that's omnipresent um, in the Senate. Um, uh, it's a similar story. All the, the districts are several times, several times bigger, several times the number of people uh, geographically larger. Um, the same the same thing, at least. And this is this has not always been the case. Sometimes you've in, in past in past uh, sessions, you've had. Uh, minority or Democratic leaders from other other parts of the state, but um, in both chambers right now, uh, Democratic leaders are generally from the urban areas, Republican leaders from the from the rural uh, areas, and certainly it's something that has made this uh, a much more pronounced um, pattern uh, in recent years is just what's happening on the ground, uh, right? There's a I mean I guess this is discussed in a number of, number of different ways, but uh, I, the big sort is one is one way to to, to frame it. Uh, communities across the state, although Pennsylvania on the whole is fairly purple, if you could kind of mix people up, uh, on the ground, uh, that's not really the case, um, right? Any given community is more blue or more red uh, than it has ever been before. Um, and that's part of the reason here, surely, why, why you see the, the leadership split uh, more, and more and more between uh, Democrats from urban areas, uh, Republicans from, uh, from, uh, from rural, rural areas. And one of the ways this plays out with a great, great deal of consequence, um, you know, I'll just say, say in, in Philly, for example, is that uh, in Philly, the Democratic to Republican voter registration edge used to be only three to one, four to one, um, you know, I think maybe in three parties 20, 25 years ago. Uh, now it's more than seven to one. And whereas we used to have a handful of Republican representatives uh, on the right side of the aisle, uh, they may have had different views on things than their Democratic colleagues. They were still Philadelphians. They were still Philadelphia residents, um, and it made it made it much easier in many cases to find common ground and get some stuff done uh, because you had folks from the same community uh, from different parties. Today in Philly, uh, Representative Martina White from the from the Northeast is the only Republican uh, representative that's, that that the city of Philadelphia has. Uh, and when you look down at the House chamber, it's a big old chamber because there are 203 of these members. Uh, when Representative White is the only Philadelphian on the right side of the aisle, and you know, we probably take for granted the, you know, the benefits of when you're down there spending so much time on the floor, you're gonna, you know, kind of you're gonna mix and mingle with the folks who are around you. Uh, if we got one Philadelphian on the right side of the aisle, it's gonna make it tougher for Philadelphian, Philadelphia-focused issues to get um, 
uh, the same kind of airtime and, and discussion and a, a similar, again, a similar kind of thing can play out for other, uh, for other parts of the state. So that's, um, that's what I flag here in these, in these maps. Um, and I'll, again, I'll, I'll flag this a little bit more at the, at the end, but uh, because these voter registration trends uh, are surely not going to reverse, and if anything, they're, they're accelerating. Um, that's one reason why uh, elect certain electoral reforms, open primaries, ranked choice voting, approval voting, uh, non-partisan primaries, uh, there's, there's certainly more discussion and advocacy around, the, around those sorts of reforms now than there was 10 years ago. Uh, and because the same basic trends are happening in other states, uh, you're seeing more activity around those sorts of those sorts of reforms uh, as well, um, which I don't think that's going to solve everything, but it sure would help um, since our elections right now are certainly not set up to encourage um, uh, you know, candidates generally to to you know represent the broadest swath of, of, of the electorate from a given district. So anyway, I spend more time on uh, on the legislature uh, here. Uh, because it is listed first in the Constitution, and it's the it's the body that's you know, most supposed to most directly uh, represent the people. Uh, it's also um, uh, the, the branch where there may be the most issues that need to be fixed. Uh, there are plenty of issues with the with the executive branch uh, that uh, that need to be fixed. The judicial branch is 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 uh, is not perfect either, and there's plenty to to uh, complain about, be concerned about uh, with the judicial branch and with and with the Supreme Court. Uh, but the, it's the legislature, which I think has most folks pretty concerned about how the structure of government may change going forward. So this is why I, we spend a little bit more time uh, on uh, on this branch here. Um, let's see, check the questions here. I'll, uh, Meg, I think we'll, we'll just, we'll keep going. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, save all the questions for the, the end if that's, uh, if that's okay with folks. So that's the first branch. Uh, second branch, um, executive branch. Right, the governor has a bunch of duties and powers here that, again, would look pretty familiar um, to, I'm sure, everyone here to enforce and carry out the laws uh, to approve or veto bills that get to their desk. Uh, commander in chief of the state of the state military uh, to appoint cabinet officials. There, there's a we have a, a very large budget, uh, 35 billion plus dollar uh, budget, and and dozens and dozens of, of uh, state departments and agencies. Um, that the governor oversees, and they, uh, of course, they need to appoint uh, hopefully very capable executives uh, to those departments to, to do the work. Uh, so that's something they, which of course, generally happens at the beginning of a term, and and maybe starts to happen more towards the end as, as folks as folks leave. Uh, incidentally, just because this, there's going to be a theme of the branches not getting along very well uh, coming up throughout this. Um, we have several members of the of the executive branch department department heads who are acting because there are debates that seem to be uh, unsolvable right now between the legislature and the governor in terms of just approving improving uh, improving his cabinet and cabinet appointments. So there there are so many symptoms right now of between uh, not just the executive and the and the, the legislative branch, but the all three branches uh, things things breaking down. Uh, of course, the the governor would um, uh, has a role in the budgetary process as well, and 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 they. Uh, they initiate the budget process with a with a proposal uh, in the early in the early spring. So again, pretty basic stuff, pretty similar stuff to any other state, um, and also to uh, also to the president of the United States. So certain, certainly one difference between let's say the president and the vice president um, uh, of the United States, and here in Pennsylvania, our governor and our lieutenant governor uh, is is how they're is how they're chosen. Um, the the duties of the lieutenant governor are are pretty similar, of course to uh, assume the powers of the executive office if the governor is, is no longer able to uh, administer them, they, uh, they become you know, deathly ill or, or if, they're, uh, if they're impeached and removed, removed from office, I mean, any, or, or if, they, if they pass away, uh, any number of reasons why the governor would no, be, no longer need to be, be in a position to serve the lieutenant governor steps in, right? That's the, by far their most important duty. Uh, the lieutenant governor also presides over, uh, over the Senate which is not nearly as big a deal as it would be, or as it is in the U.S. Congress right now, where things are so tight uh, between the two parties and Vice President Kamala Harris is that deciding vote. Um, a more substantive, substantive duty that is given explicitly to the, to the Lieutenant Governor in the, in the Constitution is to chair the Board of Pardons, um, right? To review folks who have gone through the criminal justice system, have been convicted, who are, who are serving a sentence, and to give those folks a chance to have their sentences uh, commuted and you know John uh, John Fetterman, Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, uh, also running for Senate, uh, has certainly approached that position with some um, uh, with some with some bigger and higher profile perhaps uh, than some of his uh, some of his predecessors. 
So the last bullet I have there, various duties as assigned with, a, with, an, with an asterisk. And this is where there's, there's a bit of a breaking point uh, between the, the president and vice president uh, uh, combo and our, our governor, lieutenant governor. Of course, when you're, when you're running for president of the United States, you select your running mate and you run together, couple together as a, as a ticket. Uh, we elect the governor and lieutenant governor independently and, and separately. Um, and uh, that means that uh, you're right, the governor uh, only has so much control over what the lieutenant governor will say, will say or do. Um, and when there's a good working relationship between the two of them, uh, they can they can get they can they can work on some work on some issues together. Uh, if there is not a good working relationship between them, which has been the case uh, not too long ago uh, with uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Mike uh, Mike Stack Mike Stack and, uh, and and Governor Wolf, uh, things things really break down. And I think it's the well surely it is this that prior relationship where there was a toxic relationship between the Lieutenant Governor and the Governor that spurred a a constitutional reform. Um, to make the lieutenant governor uh, someone who was who was selected by by the gubernatorial candidate and by the party uh, and running together as a, as a as a ticket just like just like president vice president. Um, unfortunately, while that that change that reform, um, you know, there are principles on either 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 side of it. That particular amendment was also the vehicle SB 106, which has now become this this uh, very controversial omnibus uh, omnibus resolution. But at the core of it, initially. Uh, was this change and how, how the lieutenant governor was which, 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 uh, was selected, which is a a very a completely legitimate, in, in my view, amendment to consider and debate uh, in the in the constitution. Um, you know, lastly, here you know, these folks are elected every four years um, in, in in midterm midterm years, of course, uh, and there are two term limits uh, on each of these offices, which is pretty stip, t t pretty typical uh, of executive branch executive branch officers. Um, just. A quick review of the of the executive branch row offices, which are which are described uh, in the in the executive branch article of, of the Constitution. You got the Attorney General, right, Chief Law Enforcement Officer, prosecutes crimes, uh, represents state, uh, represents the state government and state agencies in court. Um, uh, incidentally, the some of the crimes or you know potential crimes the Attorney General is responsible for prosecuting includes uh, violations, potential violations of the Pennsylvania Election Code. Uh, they actually have uh, concurrent authority um, to pursue violations of the election code along with, with local local prosecutors. So um, again, attorney general being separately elected in the state, a little bit different from other states like like New Jersey, let's say, um, but uh, duties are duties are pretty pretty similar. Uh, the auditor general, uh, chief quote unquote fiscal watchdog, uh, conducts audits uh, of various sorts, um, both to make sure the that the numbers are lining up and that money is spent in the way that it was supposed to get spent. Um, there's also um, the ability to examine government programs and examine government agencies, including certain programs and agencies at the local level that, that receive state or federal funding, and uh, uh, examine whether or not they're performing well, whether or not whether whether they are performing efficiently with the tax dollars that they're that they're receiving. Uh, and there is um, some uh, you know some latitude here. Uh, with the auditor general as to what sorts of issues they they may focus on. For example, uh, Eugene, uh, then Auditor General Eugene uh, D. Pasquale in 26, 2019 uh, conducted a performance audit of the uh, of the Shore system, the, the voter database, the statewide vote, voter database that the Department of State administers, which um, needless to say caused some heartburn between Democrat uh, Eugene D. Pasquale and uh, the Democratic administration uh, at the at that time. So similar to um, you know a city controller uh, like um, all of our counties have uh, again overseeing the, the numbers and making sure those numbers those numbers li line up, and then lastly the treasurer also independently elected um, chief financial officer for lack of a better uh, kind of description or term and oversees a tremendous uh, a tremendous amount of not, you know, both money slash value and in, in assets um, you know much of which is 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 invested uh, in. Um, you know, very various, various sorts of various sorts of securities, um, and this this position I'll I'll, uh, I'll I might name we've we've had um, some uh, I think more like more innovative and and, and active uh, you know treasures uh, Joe Torcella does does come to mind some of the things that he did especially around trying to help families save for save for college with a, a, a new program. Um, uh, one uh, liability that's come up with the treasurer's office. In years past, is because uh, of the of the assets that the treasurer oversees and the lucrative uh, in, investment fees that come along with managing those assets. 
Uh, we've run into issues with with public corruption with this with this office, um, at least a couple times, I believe, in the past in the past 20 years or so. So, you know, even though they're these offices are independently elected, it's not like they're uh, um, it makes them immune to to issues, including including issues of, uh, of, of public corruption. But uh, those come up um, not in uh, not in gubernatorial election years with the with the governor and lieutenant governor, but in presidential election years, um, which is why we're seeing them, um, uh, which is excuse me, why we saw them on the ballot uh, two years ago in uh, in 2020. So that should be, in a nutshell, the executive branch, and then uh, very briefly the the. The judicial uh, branch, the unified judicial system, as it's referred to in the, in the state constitution, uh, multiple levels here. And at the lowest level, there are several different types uh, of local courts um, uh, across across the state. Uh, Philadelphia, as the by far the largest county and municipality, has a little bit of a different system. We have a, both a municipal court uh, and actually a traffic court that is part of that municipal court. Philadelphia's traffic court got a got abolished. Uh, 10 years or so ago because of traffic, a traffic uh, ticket fixing scandal. Uh, but we have a municipal court. Uh, Pittsburgh has, has a municipal court. And in most other, most, most, of the, most of the rest of the state, there are magisterial district uh, courts or judges who, who hear um, those, those uh, initial kind of civil or criminal, uh, criminal matters. Um, above uh, above uh, that level is the, the Court of Common Pleas, which which includes um, a, a bunch of judges, upwards of 400, uh, 460 judges. So those are the two levels of, uh, of uh, trial uh, trial courts. And then uh, above them, and I guess you know, in the news you hear you hear plenty about about all these levels. Um, but in terms of the the overall structure of government and the relationship between the branches, uh, the headlines that we would see are going to be you know predominantly coming from the three appellate levels uh, of the judiciary. Uh, not so much the superior court uh, because of the sorts of, of civil and criminal matters that it, it hears appeals on from the lower courts, but predominantly the Commonwealth Court, which is going to which is going to consider um, matters when someone is suing the the state or the or a state agency or when there are disagreements between state agencies between between the branches. So the Commonwealth Court and of course the the Supreme Court at the top of the food chain are going to are going to consider those sorts of matters, and so. When you when we have right now these these debates slash battles happening between the branches, it's it's in those two appellate courts uh, in particular where uh, they're going to be they're going to be playing a playing a role. Um, I'll I'll name just a couple like I did with the legislature, a couple of additional factors uh, we should be mindful of with our judiciary. Um, it's uh, it is elected, uh, and that is that's not exactly uncommon, but it's not the way it works in in all states, and there has been plenty of advocacy. Going back 30, um, at least 30, 35 years, uh, with with Pennsylvania's crown of courts kind of leading the way on reforming the way we elect, or rather the way we select our judges, uh, and moving away, moving away at least for the appellate levels uh, from from full you know full fledged statewide elections to uh, to a merit selection system, um, and this is one where there there are reasonable people on both sides of this debate. Uh, the Committee of Seventy, obviously, you know, Pennsylvania's Vermont courts. I believe the, the legals as well for many, many years has supported, um, you know, merit selection systems. Um, but you know, I think the the reasons to consider a change have become more pronounced in recent years, uh, in part because of the the uh, the hyper partisanship that is that is uh, getting into each of the branches, but also the the sheer amount of money that is being spent in our elections, and not just over uh, over legislative elections, state and federal, but in judicial elections as well. And the 2015 uh, judicial elections in Pennsylvania, and specifically the the, uh, the Supreme Court races in 2015, where there were three open seats, um, were the most expensive judicial elections in the history of the United States. Um, I believe it was roughly 17 million dollars spent only in those judicial elections for the for the for the three Supreme Court seats, uh, predominantly through um, outside money. Uh, right, super PACs that were enabled by uh, by Supreme Court Supreme uh, Court decisions from uh, from ten to twelve ten to twelve years ago. So uh, the the reasons to consider merit selection, or at least a, a different system uh, other than an elected system, uh, I think have shifted a, a good bit uh, in recent years, in part because of Citizens United and just the sheer amount of money, unaccountable money that gets spent by independent expenditure groups, um, i.e., super PACs, uh, to influence uh, to influence these races. Um, so um, the other thing I'll name is that with regard to the, the disagreements between the, the branch, 
the brand, branch is. I mean, the, the governor, Governor Tom Wolf and the legislature, uh, it seems like there are always headlines around the disagreements between, you know, around various issues that, that they have. Um, but the Supreme Court as well has, has played to, to an extent some role uh, in exacerbating the tensions between uh, you know, between the branches, and there have been there have been several uh, several court decisions uh, in in recent years that I think it's fair to say they could they're re they're very reasonable uh, folks, informed informed legal scholars on on both sides of them. Uh, one of them, one of them, I hate to say it, is even the the 20, 2018 uh, uh, gerrymandering case that the that the League of Women Voters uh, led, I mean, the Committee Seventy, and the Draw the Lines Initiative. We were we were pleased to see that outcome. Uh, it was an outrageous set of maps that we were living with for for seven eight seven or eight years there, and 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 uh, you know un, undemocratic the way they were the way they were drawn. Um, but that that particular court decision um, certainly uh, made the legislature white white hot. And I know that there are there are differing uh, you know legal opinions. I think legitimate and reasonable legal opinions on, on both both sides of that both sides of that case. Uh, other similar cases that have come up um, include the. The 2020 decision to provide an extra three days for mail-in ballots to, to come in that was in the in, for the June primary, which, as we all recall from from that summer, uh, was incredibly hectic, incredibly confusing, incredibly tense, uh, and the court decided, largely on its own, uh, that there there needed to be three extra days for, for mail-in ballots to, to come in, um, which the the legislature, of course, is the law the lawmaking body and and. Uh, our election code dictates pretty much all of our election rules. Uh, took uh, took some issue with that. The most recent the most recent battle, which admittedly is is, is somewhat complicated uh, politics and, and policy wise, uh, was or has been the emergency powers uh, uh, dispute between the executive branch and the legislative branch, and which the the Supreme Court weighed in as well uh, in in twenty in twenty twenty, and of course the legislature then responded and I guess has continued to respond with these constitutional amendments including the two uh, regarding emergency powers that they put into the constitution or that the they got to the ballot and then the voters willingly or, or, or knowingly or unknowingly uh, put that uh, you know put those amendments that uh, put those amendments in so those those are three recent decisions um, that were you know you know fair to say uh, you know controversial even though, again the, the first one the committee said we were we were glad to see that decision glad to see those, those maps thrown, thrown out but they have exacerbated the tension between those the, the branches and certainly the legislature at least the Republican leaders have decided uh, one way in, in how they're going to respond uh, to their to their fellow branches on on this matter so that's that's just what I name here as we're looking at this uh, at this one this one slide actually on the uh, on the judicial branch so uh, this is not state government. This is a uh, this is local government. That we have a, a slide on here. The reason I'm going to put I'm, I'm putting this up is because there are so many matters uh, that local governments decide on, including elections, uh, which which are important. And uh, our local governments get their power from uh, from the state. They are creatures of the state, um, and that includes not only the the counties. Right, we have 67 counties. Most of them, not all of them, but but a lot of them. Most of them have uh, county governments overseen by three elected county commissioners. There has to be um, a minority party representation on those county commissioners, uh, those county commissioners' bodies. And then there's a whole set of elected row offices uh, in many or most counties as well. Um, which I think in 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 seventies view, in seventies view, it's not like we we haven't actively lobbied lobbied around this. But uh, you know, I think in, you know, generally in our view, this is an awful lot of stuff for voters to keep track of. And I'm not sure in what universe voters can keep track of the candidates for all these offices, the offices themselves, and what they do, uh, and then be in, be, be in a good position to put folks in, you know, on their qualifications or, or on their on their merits. But that's a that's definitely a conversation for another day because I don't I don't think any of these elected positions are going to change. But I do put this up because you know we have these again in most counties, uh, county commissioners who oversee uh, county you know, county government. We have municipalities as well. Uh, of various classes, uh, depending on how large they are. So there is one city of the first class, for example, that's the city of Philadelphia. I believe there are, there are not one, but two cities of the second class, Pittsburgh and, and, uh, and Scranton. And then there are several different classes of, of, uh, of township, and I believe just only one class of class of boroughs. But uh, again, the, the powers that these localities have uh, does stem from the state. And um, there are plenty of limitations, certainly within state law on a whole variety of issues. Uh, around what these uh, what these localities uh, can do, that includes uh, even those localities that have home rule, um, which is a dozen and a half, uh, maybe dozen, a couple dozen uh, jurisdictions. 
uh, both both municipalities and, and counties. And the but the home rule principle, which has been around for for uh, for a long time, you know, basically allows a locality to determine its its own structure of a government. So here in the city of Philadelphia, we have a a 1951 home Philadelphia home rule charter that describes you know our mayor, our city council. Um, and the, the various departments under the mayor and the various powers of city council, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's there's a similar arrangement, at least in some of their some of jurisdictions. Uh, school districts and, and municipal authorities of various types as well, sewers, service, uh, water service uh, are also in existence. But I, I put this I put this up because um, so much of what state government is is really important. Of course, this is an even numbered election year uh, where we have state and federal offices on the ballot. But in odd numbered election years, like next year, uh, most of these offices will be coming up on the ballot uh, uh, as, as well, or instead, uh, these these offices, and then some number of uh, some number of judicial seats. So it's never too early to start thinking about those those judicial elections. Uh, and the other reason um, I, you know, we spend just a couple minutes on these local these local entities is because uh, the one example I wanted to put out there for. Um, how things are not working uh, between the branches involves local government too. So this is a, a, a recent salient example of a, of, of a breakdown. This is something I'm sure everyone here has read something about. It's been in the news plenty. It's been, this has been an ongoing dispute. Um, so I'll just walk through here how this started, kind of where we are and the reason we're not, we're not, we're not even finished with this, as simple as a, as simple as a matter as, a, as this is. So our, our election code, the vast majority of it is quite old, um, regardless of, of the, the, the couple different acts, the several different acts that have been passed over the past couple of years. Most of the election code is from 1937. And if you, if you, if you look it up, it certainly reads, uh, it reads pretty old. Uh, and there is one sentence in this, in this massive antiquated body of law um, that says this, the elector shall um, then fill out date and sign the declaration printed on such envelopes. So, so this language previously was only applicable to absentee ballots, right, which are in our constitution um, and are specifically for use for a given reason if a voter is gonna be outside a municipality or sick or disabled and otherwise uh, unable to get to a polling place, uh, the absentee ballot was available to them. And this is a, a sentence from the absentee ballot portion of the election code. Uh, pretty much the same sentence word for word is in a section of the election code that deals with uh, provisional ballots, um, which I guess would have been set up in the aftermath of uh, the 2002 Help America, Help America Vote Act. But in any event, this sentence was first written, to my understanding, in 1937. Probably seemed harmless enough uh, at that time. Uh, they figured that that uh, uh, not only was there other information to fill on the back of the envelope, address, uh, and printing a name, but I guess they thought at the time a date was important. And of course, the, the signature is absolutely important because this there is a declaration or an affidavit on this outside return envelope that you know, the voter is basically saying, I am who I say I am and I'm a registered voter. So this is the sentence uh, that um, uh, was originally written in 1937. But in 2019, uh, when the legislature passed with bipartisan support, I might add, there were both Democrats and Republicans who voted for Act 77. There were Democrats and Republicans who did not vote for Act 77. Uh, and then the, then the governor signed it. They basically took uh, in that act uh, provisions that previously applied only to absentee ballots and they copied them and pasted them into a new section of the code uh, to create the, the new, the new mail-in ballot, right? Which, which is now available to any registered voter. That was in October of 2019 when, this, when, that, when that bill was passed, turned into Act 77. Uh, 2020 happened, the, the pandem pandemic of course exploded in, in, uh, in, in March of that year and uh, vote by mail use or specifically the mail-in ballot uh, use just absolutely exploded. Whereas before absentee ballots were a very small portion of votes cast would rarely impact the, the, the outcome of, a, of an election, especially a big, never, never a big election. All of a sudden uh, mail-in and absentee ballots, but especially mail-in ballots, they matter a great deal because they are now in a, in a big election year, uh, a couple of million of them being cast uh, by, by Pennsylvanians. So that's the that's a big change. Uh, the thing is, previously in this old bit of law, the county boards of election, and this is why we, we just spent a couple minutes on, on local government, those three county commissioners, and in, in a, a few of the home rule jurisdictions, it's just a little bit different, but there's always in every county, a board of elections with bipartisan representation. 
they've interpreted that sentence a little bit differently, uh, depending on depending on the county. Some counties previously had been counting the ballots with a date uh, because they they made a choice in their interpretation of the law that it didn't matter uh, as to the legitimacy of that vote, whether or not the date was handwritten on there. In other counties, they decided that the date, you know, the law it says shall. I mean, shall is shall means shall. Um, if if that date is not included, they should not count them. So you got 67 different counties. They're doing this. Uh, they're doing this different ways. Previously, and for most of our, you know, history here with this code, never mattered. All of a sudden, it matters a great deal, and that's what spurred all. Well, not all, but a good deal of the, of the litigation. Uh, that we're actually we've been we've been dealing with up until very recently, and that we we should probably expect more of state level litigation, federal level lit lit litigation. Uh, one of these suits did make its way to the Supreme Court um, that uh, that led it to a, a fractured decision where the 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 decision was basically that in the in that given 2020 judicial race, they were going to count the undated ballots for that race because I think there were reasons around this being this being a new. Uh, a new issue, voters weren't familiar with the, with the with the need, et cetera, et cetera. But going forward, and I believe Justice David Wecht was uh, the the swing the swing vote on on this matter. Going forward, though, you know we should probably be uh, not counting these ballots because the law says shall the, the voters shall date uh, date the declaration envelope. So that was that was one suit uh, that that did make its way to the top of the Supreme Court, uh, top of our judiciary. After that, our Department of State under the governor, instructs counties to count undated ballots going forward. Uh, and then most recently, what you've probably seen in the headlines is after this uh, 2022 primary, where even, even the, the Oz and McCormick campaigns were ended up ended up suing each other over, over this matter. Um, we had several counties board, county boards of election, I guess four at the end of the day, uh, three of them at least were, were identified and named by the Department of State, uh, decided still, uh, de despite uh, st de despite the part of state Department of State instructions, despite that Supreme Court decision, or maybe perhaps aligned with that Supreme Court decision or allowed by that Supreme Court decision, that they still they still they still were not going to count these things. So that initiated another lawsuit from the governor and the Department of State towards those counties. And only very recently, in the past couple of weeks, did we have uh, the Commonwealth Court to make way all the all the way all the way up to the Supreme, but the Commonwealth Court ordered those counties to count the ballots. So. Uh, the reason I walk through all those steps is because there's this very, very, bit, very small bit of election law uh, that spurs this argument. And if you ask uh, basically any election official or any election expert, they will all tell you the same thing policy wise, that the date does not matter on the outside of these envelopes, especially when uh, or regardless even of um, when the return deadline is. And of course, the return deadline for mail-in ballots uh, and absentees is eight o'clock on election night. It doesn't matter whether or not there's a date on there. Like the the, the votes a vote. Um, so regardless of the policy debate being very straightforward, uh, the legislature is is unwilling to fix this uh, or a number of other what should be pretty straightforward things. Um, and uh, the governor uh, and the legislature have been able, unable to negotiate or and find a compromise around this and other matters that they that they should be able to. And that's what led. That's what's led that breakdown in the legislature. The breakdown between the legislature and the executive branch is what's led all of this activity to shift over to the judicial branch, um, which has happened. Uh, I'd, I think more and more, not just in Pennsylvania among our branches, but in the federal government as well. Uh, and it's certainly not the way things were supposed to work, and it's certainly not uh, certainly not healthy. Um, and uh, you see this play out just over over and over again. So. Um, this is, it's not, I realize it's not a, a particularly happy theme or a happy, happy story, uh, happy story here. Um, and maybe, th maybe this, this doesn't add on. There are so many things that, uh, surely I know everyone here wishes we could, we could fix uh, about this. Redistricting reform, campaign finance, fixing the election code, mayor selection. I mean, all this stuff, um, and didn't get it done this session. We'll have to see what things look like, uh, after this gubernatorial election and with, with the next, with the next legislature. But all sorts of reforms that in Harrisburg we're gonna we're gonna have a hard time getting done, um, which leads us to the question of what we can do, what we do now. There are all sorts of different avenues to you know to advocate right now uh, as a resident, as a citizen of Pennsylvania. The two things I'll, I'll name is is uh, you know the, the Fix Harrisburg campaign, which is a campaign uh, of Fair Districts PA and the League of League of Women League of Women Voters, of course, uh, is focused right now on the legislative rules, right? So that that how a bill becomes a law map. The, the rules that the, that the that they pass and that the leaders kind of dominate uh, 
make the legislature not function the way it's supposed to. Uh, that's a campaign to try to fix that. And when we have, uh, or after we have this election, we'll ha we will have a new class of lawmakers uh, in January um, uh, of 2024 when they'll, when they'll consider these rules again. That's a campaign to try to fix those rules. Um, there's also, I might suggest, not just uh, with the, I guess, Fix Harrisburg, but certainly, obviously, like the legal, legal women voters with the litigation they've initiated, initiated around the constitutional amendments, but um, 70 has a voter education program, We Vote. Uh, between the league, the Committee 70, and dozens of other groups, really, uh, everybody's pretty much sounding the alarm around the, this constitutional amendment um, surge that, that we've seen uh, over the past couple, past couple of years. At least 80 proposed amendments in, in this session alone um, that of, of, of all on all sorts of issues, most of them are coming from Republicans. Uh, a few of them are pretty benign or even make sense. Uh, a lot of them are just policy that has no business in the Constitution. And then there's some of these proposals uh, that would change for the worse uh, the relationship between the between the branches. So um, this is this is going to be a, an issue that's not going away. It may ultimately be a battle at the ballot at the ballot box, which is whether through through the League of Women Voters or the Committee of 70 or any other group um, you want to activate yourself around this stuff. So I'll pause there uh, over time. Um, if we have any time for questions, that'd be great. And then I'll hand it back to uh, Rochelle and Meg. Thank you so much, Pat. Um, I love that you gave us action steps at the end. Always nice to have actionable things and takeaways to do. So I will now facilitate some q and I've, I've seen some questions coming in through the the Q&A function over the course of Pat's presentation, but I invite anyone else with additional questions uh, to drop them in. Um, I'll start with a question via um, regarding the Lieutenant Governor, um, Pat. Um, so we had a question, um, are there any upsides to electing the Lieutenant Governor that you can see? Um, you know, you mentioned the constitutional amendments. That was one of the proposed constitutional amendments that Pennsylvanians elect Lieutenant Governor. Um, mm -hmm. Do you see any upsides to that? Well, you know, given given that it is um, it is an important office, and uh, I guess it is it is, it is the most important. Uh, if in the event that the governor is unable to uh, perform their perform their duties anymore, to have someone who was independently elected by by all the voters, I mean, there there's uh, there's some, there's some merit there. Um, this is you know I, I think uh, this is one of the, this one where this is one where there are definitely principled principled ar arguments on, on both sides. Um, on the other side, I guess the most recent examples when when the two are not on the same page, which they really should be to, to be most effective, um, uh, it, it it doesn't it doesn't help. And uh, we just have I, I think a recent example of that which which spurred that amendment. But this is this is an example of uh, of all the of the eighty proposed amendments out there. Uh, one that it, it's not benign because it's actually it's pretty important. But the principled arguments on on both on both sides of it. Uh, and as we mentioned earlier, it's just it's unfortunate that this this legitimate proposed amendment has has been the vehicle for the rest of the the rest of the uh on the bus proposal with with things that are controversial right that makes a lot of sense uh, another great question that we got was um do you have do you or or 70 have any ideas for how to increase representation and engagement with the groups that are not represented by their legislators. So for example, more progressive people living in rural areas, um, you know, more conservative people living in the city. Um, have any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is, I mean, this is this is a tough one. I mean, I, I named the the sorts of structural changes uh, that we could that we can make um, that would I think help in, incentivize candidates and then city officials to, to to seek out and represent a broader, a broader swath of the electorate. The uh, the open primaries proposal, like that, that uh, the league and the seventy and a number other number of organizations have, have put forward, is 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 some place to start. And it's 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 only independent voters who could pick one side or or, or the other. But um, yeah, I think the the sorts of reforms that maybe right now we just dream about, uh, but other states are experimenting with, would be nonpartisan primary systems, top two, top three, top four, top five, followed by ranked choice voting or approval voting. And that in that sort of system, yeah, if you're a conservative voter. In a, in a liberal progressive area, if you're a liberal progressive voter in a, in a, in a conservative rural area, um, you will have a better chance to have, to have your preferences expressed through the, through the election system. And yeah, right now the, the primary system is, is certainly um, causing some harm uh, and pushing, pushing politics to the wings. Absolutely. And um, you know, maybe we can drop some information in the, in the chat about our, our, our collective advocacy on open primaries and um, encourage people to get more involved in that. 
Um, looks like we have time for one more question. Um, we had a great one in the Q&A about um, asking Pat if you could elaborate a little more about um, the, the rules, so the House rules, which are voted on, you know, day one of the new legislature and how that gives a lot of power to mm -hmm. committee chairs. Could you just, you know, explain a little bit more about how that works? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I just, I guess, to, to give to give warnings, one point point out one one issue. It's it's the it's the committee chairs uh, who have uh, pretty much un, un, unlimited power to decide are they are they going to call a hearing on a, on a given bill or piece or, or number of bills to call a meeting and actually have a vote a vote on them. You know, sometimes they take cues and work with collaborate with the with the, the leadership at the top of the food chain. Other times they have a good bit of leeway. Um, and I think in the in in the House state government led by Seth Grove. You know, to our, to our understanding, like Representative Grove has a good bit of leeway in, in uh, what he brings up and bring, brings up in his committee, and that's a problem because that's too much power for for one person and for one caucus. And whether, um, and as, as the league and fair districts has talked about for for uh, uh, so much, when there are issues with bipartisan support, um, they can get they can get held up um, with the power being concentrated in in one person. Just a, a quick little anecdote on that: there was a a changeover in committee leadership, and I was around the the staffer for the incoming chair of this committee, um, and uh, I, she made a comment about how she never really thought much about the legislative process until her boss had become a chair of a committee, um, and that, that I think that tells you something about their, their rank and file. Um, they are not there, or most of them are not there, and or, or have have an active role in the legislative process. They do they do they do constituent services. Some of them. Are as active as it, as it can possibly be, but ultimately the powers with the is with the chairs, the party leadership, and that's what the Fix Harrisburg campaign, of course, is, is all about. I have I've had similar experiences with you know friends that get their first job at the legislature with you know a member who's been there a long time, but they they don't really realize that you know um, how you know, the the lack of power that some of those members that aren't you know majority party leaders have. So. Mm -hmm. um, Pat, this was phenomenal. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Um, I was really noting as we went through that you can really tell that you were once a teacher because uh, you <laughs> explained things so clearly and effectively. So um, yeah, we have some great comments in the chat about how we found this, you know, all really worthwhile. So thank you. Um, with that, I will close, I will um, hand it over to Rochelle to close us out. Okay, thanks, Meg. Pat, it was phenomenal. Um, I particularly liked your slide on lawmaking in a nutshell. You've got Schoolhouse Rock totally beat. I want to use that slide. It was perfect. I had to give a session on how a bill becomes a law to my fair districts group about a year ago. My slide was boring, boring, boring. That was brilliant, so thank you. I just, uh, to end, uh, I am voter service director, so I would be thrown out of my job if I didn't uh, plug vote 411, vote 411 is your one stop shop for anything you want to know about the upcoming elections. You can put in your address and you will get not only who was on your ballot, but a hyperlink to the information about that particular candidate all of them that are running for that particular position. It will give you their biographical information, meaning personal and employment. It will give you their positions on four issues that the league has posed to all the candidates, as well as links to their websites and social media platforms. But besides candidate information, if you want to know your polling location, if you want to get the address and your phone number for your county election office, if you want to know your House and Senate and Congressional District, you can find it on Vote 411, as well as all of the important dates, voter registration, deadline October 24th, mail-in ballot application deadline November 1st, and obviously November 8th, when you have to either show up at the polls or get your mail-in ballot in. So vote411.org. I'm pretty sure that, that Sam put it in the chat, but it is an incredible, it's the jewel of the League of Women Voters. 
I do want to plug the next two ballot box basics because Pat touched on one of the areas and there was a question in the chat about another. So in September 13th, we are going to have Jonathan Marks, who is the Deputy Secretary of State for Elections, who will be talking about anything you want to know about the election administration, the security of elections, the security of your ballot, security that goes on in the county election offices. And you can ask all of your election questions to Jonathan Marks. Then on October 3rd, we're going to be doing a deep dive into the constitutional amendment process that Pat touched on. We're going to have Susan Gobreski, who is our brilliant government policy director, who will be talking about the process on how these constitutional amendments end up on your ballot and could show up primary 2023, as well as some of the substantive constitutional amendments that Pat just had a chance to touch upon. So please, please join us September 13th and October 3rd. Thank you all for your time, for being terrific participants and we will end the webinar. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.